Okay, welcome back to Evidence for the Resurrection of Christ, Refuting the Theories of the Skeptics, as our uh, unit of, uh, part of our unit on apologetics for confirmation class. The last myth, or I'm sorry, the last uh, theory that we're going to refute is the one the apostles made the whole thing up, the myth theory. And it's just this one page. Uh, this is going to be the shortest one we go over, and then we'll do a review. But this is actually the most complicated, as complicated as you want to make it, I guess. But it's the most complicated, and one of the ones that people have written the most about. So as you uh, get older and you want to uh, look more at this, um, you can uh, go through it and find out that there's people that have written lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff about it. Uh, but we'll just go through these few points here, and then we'll do a review. So, the apostles made the whole thing up, the myth theory. Okay, when we read the Bible, when we read the Gospels, okay, you, when you read Scripture, you know you're reading the Bible. It has a Bible-ish feel to it. It's no, uh, no more precise than to describe it as that. When you're reading the Bible, you know you're reading the Bible. Uh, and then when you're reading something that's like the Bible, but isn't the Bible, you will immediately know, yeah, this sounds kind of like the Bible, but it ain't the Bible. And that's, that's something you're going to have a feel for right away. Um, the style of the Gospels is completely different than, say, the style of a myth. Okay, Myths have way overdone, way overblown, spectacular, childish, and exaggerated events. So you're going to have all these big things happening, idiots, explosions, and falling anvils, like a Saturday morning cartoon. And everything in the Gospels fits together neatly, and all the pieces fit together. It's a completely different style of writing in the Gospels compared to when we read the myths. Um, and you can look at myths like... Uh, Norse mythology, and if you're not into Norse mythology, watch a Marvel movie about Thor. They use elements of the myth, and you see all these different ways the stories are built up. You can watch The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings. Um, you can watch Harry Potter. That has elements of mythology to it, um, especially when they do the part about the three brothers in the last movies, right, when they talk about the Deathly Hallows. Uh, that part, especially, that is what myths sound like, okay? Again, everything in the Gospels, everything in the Bible fits together as it should. And then, this is a little bit difficult of a concept to talk about, but let's give it a whirl. Psychological depth in the Bible is at a maximum. Characters in the Bible, people in the Bible have huge depth of character, especially Jesus. Uh, you understand Jesus' character very, very well once you have read the Gospels. Uh, you get a sense of the character of, say, Pharaoh when he would not let the people of Israel go. You get a pretty good idea of what his personality was like and what kind of character he had when you read the account of the plagues of Egypt, right? So there's something that can sound like, well, that was like the myth of the plagues of Egypt. Well, no, those are things that actually happened, and you look at all the little details that are in there, and you see it doesn't sound like a fairy tale or a myth, okay? So these characters are very, very well developed, and in a myth, they don't do that. Why don't they do that? Because if you have too many personal details, that detracts away from the big story of what's going on, okay? Thor... Uh, trying to fight with the serpent, Jorgamund, that uh, encircles the world, and him going fishing for him with a boar's head, and then uh, fighting with him. If you have all these personal details about what does Thor look like, and what was he wearing, and what does the serpent look like, uh, what is it like, and how does he encircle the world? You don't have, we don't know. You don't have all those details in the myth, because that would detract from the story of Thor went fishing for this giant snake that encircles all the oceans of the world. That's the difference. So these personal details would detract from the narrative in a myth. Also, myths uh, have a lot of words. They're verbose, we would say. 
they go on and on and on describing these magnificent events. The Gospels don't. The Gospels are incredibly brief. When you look at Jesus' ministry on earth, which was three to four years, and look how short each Gospel is, and then take all four of them together, and it's still not that big. And the whole New Testament, still not that long. Look at Lord of the Rings. It's like three volumes this thick. It's a big, long story with this mythology developed in it. Uh, so again, the Gospels are laconic, we would say. They're concise. There is an economy of words. No word is wasted. And one of the reasons for that, of course, is they're trying to get this information out to people as quickly as possible, and writing is expensive. Writing materials are expensive. Uh, so they have economy of words. Nothing is wasted. Every word in the gospel serves a purpose. Myths, not so much. They go on and on and on uh, telling these incredible stories. Okay, and again, myths do not contain tiny details that aren't important to the telling of the story. The Bible is full of those kind of details, and those details don't have any bearing on the story the Gospels are telling, that the Bible is telling. Why do they include those if no words are wasted? Because that is what eyewitnesses do when they tell a story. They will say, you know, oh, uh, you know, Luke was uh, going around, they don't talk about Luke, was, uh, Luke was with Paul, Paul went around, you know, and he was shipwrecked, and there were all these barrels, and he was bitten by a snake. Uh, they put all these little tiny details in, uh, not to fill the story up, but just because you were there. When you're there and you're telling an eyewitness account, you tell what you saw, and a lot of these little tiny details come out in the telling. Uh, in myths, they don't do that. They don't have these tiny, tiny details. They all have big picture stuff because they're trying to tell a big story. Okay, and that again is the hallmark of the eyewitness account. So if the Gospels were made up, if the Apostles made the whole thing up, then they would have single-handedly created the literary genre of realistic fantasy, like The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, about 1,900 years early, uh, because nobody until Tolkien and C.S. Lewis and those kind of guys uh, came up with this idea of realistic fantasy. Everything before that was myth, these big stories. So that, that is the, the myth theory in a nutshell. And one thing I noticed, there's a point I left out, which is probably one of the more important points. There wasn't enough time, okay? So, do I really, did I really stop there? I did, okay. I am missing a couple points on the myth that I'll fill in real quick. Uh, Myths take time, okay? So you don't have a fellow like uh, Hercules who did these uh, amazing tasks in the story of the myth of Hercules. Uh, was there pro a real Hercules? Possibly. Did he do some neat stuff? Probably. But as the story gets told over hundreds of years, the stories get bigger and more incredible, and they become a myth. From the very beginning, the story that the disciples were telling about Jesus was exactly what happened. Nothing new came to the story. And even if they did, if someone wanted to inject something mythological into the Gospel accounts, again, witnesses are still alive when the Gospels were written. Okay, John, the last apostle who died a natural death, wrote his Gospel last, near the end of the first century. All the other ones were written a good bit before that. So all these people are still alive that the story is actually about. People like Jesus' mother Mary, like the apostles themselves. So these people are still around. If somebody starts pumping up the story of Jesus into something it wasn't, these eyewitnesses were around to go, yeah, that's not how it happened. You're making stuff up. And that's exactly what happens when people try to mythologize uh, real people. But over time, over hundreds of years, a story can take on mythological elements. The eyewitnesses aren't there anymore. They don't actually see what someone like Hercules did. Or uh, someone, there might have been a guy named Thor that had a hammer, maybe. Uh, there's nobody around that ever saw this person that actually knew any of the things they did. So the stories start to take on this 
mythological quality, and there's nobody there to change it. And as it gets told and told and told again, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more exaggerated, more childlike, like the story a little kid would tell. And they can tell a story, and the next thing you know, this person's turned into Superman, and he had x-ray vision. Their stories just get kind of, kind of crazy and exaggerated. And that's what happens with myths. Uh, that's what happens with mythological narrative. But it takes time. When the Gospels were written down, they were written down within a generation or two, as we talked before, of the events that they record. There were people around there to say, yeah, it didn't happen that way. This is how it actually happened. Uh, so what they wrote, obviously, was not a myth. They weren't making stuff up because that would have gotten stopped right then and there. These people are still around to kind of fact check the story. And it didn't change over time. We have seen how the Gospels were copied over time. And you don't see all of a sudden, well, here's this, you know, here is this itinerant preacher in Nazareth, and the Romans killed him and he died. And uh, some people thought they saw him after he was resurrected. And then all of a sudden, hundreds of years later, oh, he's the Son of God and he rose from the dead, and boom, boom, boom. You never see any kind of progression like that. It was always Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He was incarnate by the Holy Spirit. He was, his mother was a virgin and gave birth to him, and he grew up just like a normal person. And then he started preaching, teaching about the coming kingdom of God, and that he was the son of God, and that he was going to die for the sins of the world. From the beginning, this doesn't get added on to the story later. You have nothing like that. So that is one of the big ways you can see that, no, it's not a myth. Myths don't grow that way. Myths don't evolve that way. Nothing that happened in, in the gospel accounts looks in any shape, way, or form the way myth develops. And there are people who specialize in myth, and they have written books and books and books about this kind of thing and about how myths form. And none of the rules and observations they have made about how myths come to be in any way applies to what we see in the gospel accounts. So those are the big theories the skeptics come up with for uh, why uh, Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead. So again, our theories are Jesus didn't die. He passed out on the cross. They thought he was dead. They put him in the tomb, and he woke up later and somehow was able to tear himself out of the bandages he was wound in, uh, moved a two-ton stone, fought off an entire uh, squad of, uh, of soldiers uh, you know, trained like Navy SEALs by himself after he was, you know, half dead and then uh, ran away and then told everybody that he rose from the dead. Swoon theory doesn't hold water. The apostles were deceivers and it was a conspiracy. Again, we went through it. It doesn't hold water. Go back and listen to that one again. Uh, that is the one that probably with the hallucination theory, you will hear most often from people who are genuinely trying to make a claim against the resurrection. The swoon theory, that one is popular against people that don't really do their homework. They'll glom onto that and go, oh, that makes sense that he just passed out. Very quickly, we can dismantle that one as we've seen. There's just no way someone that was executed by Romans could have done any of those things. But the apostles were deceivers. The conspiracy, again, you know, you look at you look at people in the Middle East who are uh, um, Islamists, who are uh, on the fringes, who are extremists. These guys commit suicide all the time for something that they believe. They don't believe that it is a lie. They are dying for something that they believe is true. We know it not to be true. We know that what the Quran says is not, I'll probably get taken off of YouTube. But we know that what the Quran says is not God's word, and even so, they are taking it to an extreme uh, that was never intended. Uh, again, you will not willingly die for something that you know is a lie. Eleven out of twelve disciples died, or apostles died for what they believed. Uh, and I'm talking about Matthias, not Judas Iscariot. And then John is the only one that supposedly died of natural causes as an old man. You, you don't die willingly for something you know is a lie. You believe it to be true.
up. So we can see that there is just no way these guys could have held a conspiracy together, not in the hostile environment in which they were, where everyone was out to get them. Uh, it just would not have happened. It couldn't have happened. So, okay, maybe the apostles were deceived, this hallucination theory. Again, there is no such thing as mass hallucination. People have individual hallucinations, and they don't last a long time. Again, in extreme cases of mental illness, they may last for, for days or weeks. Uh, but in this case, they lasted for 40 days among over 500 people. Uh, they were not deceived. They were not uh, seeing things that were not there. And then this idea that the apostles made the whole thing up and it turned into a myth. Uh, we can do a much better job of this, but it's beyond uh, the scope of confirmation class to show how myths develop. Uh, just leave it as, okay, it takes hundreds of years for a myth, a legend to develop out of things that actually happen. And the things in the gospel were written down within the lifetimes of the people that they happened to. Therefore, enough time had not elapsed for things to take on an epic, mythical uh, magnitude, as some people would say. So those are the four big reasons, and once you... Uh, kind of put all of those to bed, you're only left with one, and that is that Jesus Christ actually died and actually rose from the dead on Easter morning, which is exactly what we believe to be true in Christianity. Because it is true, because we have faith that what the Bible says is true, but also, not just on faith, but based on facts, we can see from history, from the gospel accounts, and what we have learned about the Bible and how it was transmitted to us, that those are factual. The burden of proof is on someone else to prove that those things are not true, that the gospel writers are not writing down truth. Because they wrote down what they saw, and they interviewed people who saw things and wrote down those eyewitness accounts. So I hope that's helpful to you, and I hope it will be helpful to you later in life because these questions will come up. You'll hear about the swoon theory. That's going to come up. You're going to hear about the conspiracy theory. I haven't heard about the hallucination theory too much, but the myth theory, atheists love that one. And they're just not using the same reason that they would use to talk about other mythological things. Uh, they're not being uh, consistent in their argument. And if you're, if you're going to argue these things, you can't treat the Bible and you can't treat Christianity different than you treat any other kind of history. That's not fair, and it is also not intellectually honest. And if we're intellectually honest, we see what happens in the Bible is based on fact. So I hope this will be of help to you. Maybe not now, but hopefully you'll remember it and it'll jog your memory someday because someone is going to come up to you and go, oh, well, you know, the whole thing's a myth, or, oh, the apostles made it up, and, oh, you know, Jesus just passed out in the tomb. You will hear these things in your life at some point. And again, I hope that... Uh, these will jog your memory and that they will help you someday in hopefully not just refuting other people's arguments, but hopefully turning their mind around from what they're thinking to having an open mind for what the gospel says, so that if they are openly hostile to Christianity, maybe, maybe by you talking to them, the Holy Spirit can use you so that possibly he will enter their heart and they might come to faith in Christ too which is the whole point of all of this, is to share what we know to be the truth of Jesus Christ and sh share it with the world as he told us to do. Thank you. Have a blessed day.